Welcome to another exciting message from America's pace-setting life coach, Dr. Dave Williams. After more than 30 years of leading a flourishing church and overseeing the establishment of over 500 growing daughter churches in America, Africa, and Asia, he has the first-hand experience that will help you succeed and be fruitful in your life's calling, whether in ministry or marketplace. Dave Williams is a teacher, coach, and trainer to successful pace-setting leaders. And now, Here's Dr. Dave Williams. There are people who have the dagger of envy and jealousy in their hearts that want to erase any mark you make. They did it to Jesus, they did it to Paul, they did it to Nehemiah. They did it to Moses. They did it throughout the scriptures. Anybody that is making a mark, being successful and victorious, somebody comes along to try to erase the victory. That's the nature of the devil. We're going to be talking about the 15th dagger that goes into self-sabotage that makes a person a serial loser, not even realizing. Many people subvert their success, relationships, work, business, church, ministry, whatever, they subvert it themselves and they don't even realize what they're doing. They don't understand that there is a dagger, one of the daggers of self-sabotage that's draining the life out of them that's going to set them up for failure after failure after failure after failure. And I want you to know from God's heart, He, he loves you incredibly. And it pleases His heart to see you prosper and be in health. It pleases his heart to see you succeed, to be the winner that he's called you to be. You know, I think of John the Baptist. He was the headliner. He was the crowds. And then along comes Jesus, and John the Baptist has to point out Jesus and say, here's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now the focus is off John and on Jesus. And John said, he must increase and I must decrease. He could have got envious like the chief priests did. They were envious, we're told. They envied Jesus. They envied his leadership, his popularity, his miracles. They couldn't duplicate it. So let's get rid of the one who's making the mark. Just at general council last week, and you hear stories there. Pastor Matthew uh, Barnett, what a guy. He wrote the book, The 24-Hour Church, The Church That Never Sleeps. Best-selling book. He's a legend. He's a legend in his own time, and he's still in his 20s. But I guess a guy walked into church all dressed up like Jesus, looked like Jesus. And Matthew, he's friendly. He walked over and says, hi, I'm Pastor Barnett. And this guy looked like Jesus said, yeah, I know who you are. And Matthew said, what's your name? He said, I'm Jesus. And you know, you run into all kinds out in L.A. (laughs) And Matthew said, hey, did you ever see Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ movie? The guy said, no, I couldn't watch it. Brought back too many old memories. (laughs) (laughs) I would say that guy self-sabotaged. It's called the inner monster. We're calling it the inner monster, your own subversion, unconscious sabotage. And we're talking about number 15 this week, envy and its evil cousin jealousy. Envy and its evil cousin jealousy is a dagger that will go in your heart, draining the life out of you, draining the life out of your marriage, draining the life out of your business. It can take you from being a close friend to being a bitter enemy. This thing called envy can break up families, tear apart churches, ruin communities, destroy businesses, liquidate fortunes, and torpedo all positive progress in a person's life. Envy is corruptive, destructive, deadly, malicious, toxic, venomous, menacing, malignant, serpentine, and twisted. There is nothing good about envy. In all of its multifaceted forms, it is a self-sabotage dagger and conforms with the symptoms of a serial loser. And I'm sure you don't want to be conformed to a serial loser.
How many of you ever heard of the tooth fairy? I read a story not long ago about a second grader who had collected a fair amount of money from the tooth fairy. Every time she lost a tooth, she'd put it in a small envelope, and in the morning the tooth would be gone, and there would be $2 under it. It was just great until she visited a friend who had lost a tooth and told her, I put my tooth under the pillow, and when I woke up in the morning, there was $10 there. $2 is great until you hear that a friend gets $10 from their tooth fairy. The little girl talked to the other girl's mother and said, would you call my mother and tell her which tooth fairy you use? <laughs> Envy. We're bombarded daily by advertisements letting us know we can get something we don't have if we call a certain number. Or we can get something uh, that we want if we pay a certain price. Advertisers are only successful when they can create dissatisfaction in us with the way things are now. You can be more, you need more, you've got to have more, and they show you all these people that have experienced using this bouncing ball and have lost 600 pounds in three days, and you want that. But a Greek proverb says, as rust corrupts iron, so envy corrupts man. I want to read from James chapter 3 today, beginning with verse 16. I want to start from the message and then read verse 16 from the Amplified. Do you want to be counted wise, to build a reputation for wisdom? Here's what you do. Live well, live wisely, live humbly. It's the way you live, not the way you talk, that counts. Mean-spirited ambition isn't wisdom. Boasting that you are wise isn't wisdom. Twisting the truth to make yourselves sound wise isn't wisdom. It's the furthest thing from wisdom. It's animal cunning, devilish conniving. Whether you're trying to look better than others or get the better of others, things fall apart and everyone ends up at the other's throats. Now the Amplified. For wherever there is jealousy, envy, and contention, rivalry, and selfish ambition, there will also be confusion, unrest, disharmony, rebellion, and all sorts of evil and vile practices. Here, St. James tells us that envy, jealousy, and selfish ambition actually can bring evil, disorder, and confusion into our lives, our churches, our homes, every place we go. Envy, jealousy, Contention, because of selfish ambition, brings in confusion. What is envy? W.E. Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words says, Envy is displeasure produced by witnessing or hearing of the advantage or prosperity of others. This evil sense always attaches to this word. In other words, in the Bible, envy is never spoken of in a positive way. Envy desires to deprive another of what he has. Roger's New Millennium Thesaurus gives synonyms for envy. Backbiting, bad sportsmanship, coveting, green-eyed monster, grudge, grudging, hatred, ill will, maliciousness, malignity, resentfulness, resentment, rivalry, and spite. James said all these things will bring confusion, complication into your life and lead to self-sabotage. We all remember the so-called pom-pom mom in Texas. Her daughter was not selected to be on the high school cheerleading team. And the mother put a contract to have the girl murdered whom she identified as the one who took her daughter's place. Fortunately, the plot was found out. It's called a green-eyed monster what a monster envy had produced in this mother's life. And then real close to here, not more than 80 miles from here, a postal worker lost a job promotion to a fellow worker, and he became so enraged with envy that he took a gun and shot the man that got the promotion twice in the head and then turned the gun on, on himself and shot himself. Is it any wonder that a synonym for envy is green-eyed monster, it, it monster? And another word from Roger's is a malignancy. Now, when you think of a malignancy, what do you think about? You think about something that's 
fatal, deadly, lethal, something that's going to grow slowly until it chokes the life out of you. And that's exactly what it says in Proverbs 14.30. It says, a peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. Jealousy is like a cancer, a malignancy in the bones. And then Roger gives some antonyms, the opposite of envy. And it says, generosity, being content, and being satisfied. There are other definitions that I looked up for the sake of time. We'll move on. Because I want to look at what are some of the signs of this dagger, this self-sabotage dagger called envy. Some of the signs. Sign number one, lack of contentment. If you're not content, it may be a sign of envy. You might be envious of what a neighbor has or what a neighbor is. It may be something on a store shelf or something you saw on television, but you don't have it. Somebody else has it, you want it, and you don't think they should have it. Because you deserve it more than they deserve it. You know what that is? The tip of the dagger is already in your heart. And the devil is ready to slice it the rest of the way in to bleed the life out of you. See, according to U.S. News and World Report, in a poll that was done among Americans, asked what would it take in terms of annual income for you to live the American dream, people that made $25,000 a year on the average, said $54,000 a year would fulfill the American dream for me. People that made $100,000 a year said they'd take $192,000 a year on the average to fulfill the American dream. In other words, no matter who was interviewed, the American dream, the fulfillment of the American dream for that person was usually twice as far away as where they were today. So if you compare your possessions, your position, your financial status, with your neighbor, sooner or later, envy is going to rob you of happiness. You'll always want more than you have. You'll never be content, never generous, and happiness will take wings. So number one, if you find yourself not content, Paul said I'm in content no matter what state I'm in, it could be that the tip of the dagger is already in your heart. Number two, is a lack of joy in others' achievements, accomplishments, and blessings. You go out fishing eight hours, and all you got was a sunburn. You pull ashore, and there's a seven-year-old kid fishing off the dock holding a 10-pound rainbow. Now, what is your reaction? I can't believe I spent eight hours in that blistering sun, and I didn't get anything, and this seven-year-old jerk gets a 10-pound rainbow or 10-pound bass. Or do you rejoice? Kid... Man, you could teach me a few things. I've been out there eight hours and all I caught was three little old minnows. What is your reaction? That tells how much of a future you have as it relates to success and prosperity. You go to putting down that boy for catching something bigger than you caught. You're setting yourself up for sabotage. You're sabotaging your life, sabotaging your future. A child throws a temper tantrum when he sees that his brother or sister has something that he wants or she wants. Or ladies, when you're at the clothing store and you see a woman trying on clothes three sizes smaller than your size, clothes that don't even come in your size, what is your reaction? Well, you know, maybe she eats a quarter of a meal a day and works out four times a week. Maybe. Or do you see... I hate her. It's a sin to look as good as she looks. I don't know why I can't look that good. Hey, let's go get some Krispy Kremes. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Self-sabotage. Number three, wanting something somebody else has. Stories told about this poor guy who used to murmur to the giant landowner of the unfairness of it all. It's unfair that you own so much land and I own hardly anything. The landowner said, all right, I'll tell you what. I'll give you all the land you can walk around in a whole day. This poor guy greedily tried to take in all the area possible. He started just running around and, and overexerted himself and dropped dead of a heart attack. Died, ended up with nothing. 
when I hear a minister say something like, stick with me because my ministry is going to be bigger than Kenneth Copeland's, I know that the dagger of envy is in the heart of that minister. And only an emotionally and spiritually handicapped person would follow a minister like that because envy always leads ultimately to arrogance. If I ever get in this pulpit and say, boy, stick with me, I'm going to be as big as Robert Schuler someday, run from me. I don't envy his ministry. I was looking at a picture of Bill Hybels' church, Willow Creek. What a beautiful church. I'm inspired by it, but I thank God for what Bill Hybels has done in the Chicago area. I don't envy him one bit because I know the bigger the church, the more the challenges many times. Number four, bitterness in our talk about others who have more either in possession or position. When a person is walking in envy, eventually it begins to show signs. When you talk, it's like a snake coming out of your mouth and your ears start looking pointed to everybody else. That's not really true, but in a spiritual sense, uh, you can see that. You got something I want. I don't like that you have it, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to speak bitter about you and maybe I can create the climate that somebody will give me what you've got whether it's in position or possession. Because when you make your mark in this world, a lot of people out of the self-sabotage dagger of envy begin showing up and trying to erase your mark. How many of you have ever said, how come God answers his prayers and not mine? I'm a better Christian than he is. In fact, I know some things about him that he shouldn't have got his prayer answered. And I'm going to go tell a few people about it. You know what you're doing? You're setting yourself up for unanswered prayer in that area. And then number five is thinking or dreaming of plots, whether they're subtle or overt, against others who have made a mark, achieved, or accomplished something notable. Remember, after a person makes his mark in the world, a lot of people begin showing up with erasers. Envy thinks you have something I want. When we hear the news of the latest $500 million lottery winner, What's our first thought? How can a jerk like that win $500 million? He'll have it spent one year. Now, if I had that $500 million, you know what? The tip of the dagger's there. Now, how does envy and its evil cousin jealousy sabotage and destroy our lives? Number one, envy incapacitates our ability to enjoy what we have. When Daniel worked to be wiser, smarter than all the others. He was promoted above the three governors. And they got together and they said, we've got to find some scandal on Daniel. We've got to get him out of leadership. What makes him think he can lead us? The king appointed him over the other governors. And they got together in, in Daniel 6 and they said, we can't find any scandal. We've got to come up with something else against him. Remember, when you make your mark, a lot of people start showing up with erasers. Because of envy. Envy incapacitates our ability to enjoy what we have. Number two, envy undermines our relationships. And the patriarchs, moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him. Joseph's brothers, out of envy and jealousy of their brother Joseph, sold him into slavery. Now, it not only affected their relationship with their brother, it affected their relationship with their father. Envy starts affecting relationships everywhere. It affected the relationship with their father because they had to lie to their father and they had to live with the lie. And that curse was not broken until years later when uh, through circumstances of meeting up with Joseph again, Joseph forgave them. Relationship with leaders. You, you think you can do a better job in leading? See, the dangerous thing is what happens when we envy those that are over us. It could be a wife envying her husband or a husband envying his boss or you know, a worker envying the owner of, of the store or a member envying the pastor, another pastor envying the pastor. You could envy a political leader, you know. And you, once you begin envying, you risk the danger of being disrespectful and disobedient. It usually begins when you get upset. Something the leader says or does, it just claws at you. 
You can't get over it. Envy sets in and you say, well, how did he or she get into such a position of authority? Well, if I was there, I'd do a better job than them. If I was governor, I could do a better job than our governor. Well, if only I was president, if only you were president, all the world's problems would be solved, right? And then we start making subtle hints. I watch out for this. You know, I don't like the decision, but I have to live with it. Now, if I were in charge, I would have done it differently. Here's the way I would have done it. That's exactly what Absalom did against his father, David. It's exactly what Judas did. Judas didn't like the way Jesus was running things. Envy set in. And he started pilfering from the treasury. And he started creating problems. Envy destroys and undermines our relationships. Number three, envy debilitates our security. When envy steps in, God steps out. Because with envy, you begin to take things into your own hands instead of letting God take control. I like what you got. I don't have what you got. I want what you got. I read uh, an article I had clipped about after 9-11. There was only one airline that was making money. It was only making half as much as it was the previous year, but it was making money. All the other airlines were filing bankruptcy. They were in the red, losing billions of dollars. And the airline that was making money was an airline where they, their pilots were paid about $15,000 less than the pilots of all the airlines that were failing. The workers made more money, and some of the union guys got together on the airline that was making money, but barely making just half as much as they were the previous year. And they said, you know, the airlines of TWA, they're, they're paid, those, are, those DC-9 pilots are paid $90,000 a year, and we're only paid $80,000 a year. I think we ought to strike for the $90,000. The only airline that was making money, all the rest of them, do you find any TWA today? No. It's gone. It was gobbled up by another company. And, and do you, I don't know about you, but I can see insanity in that. We've got job security... Our company is making money. There's profit sharing with the employees. Why would I want to be like the one going bankrupt? <laughs> Dwight Moody once uh, told a fable about an eagle that was envious of another eagle that could fly better and higher. And one day, the bird saw a sportsman with a bow and arrow and said to him, I wish you'd bring down that eagle up there. The man said, well, I would if only I had some feathers for my arrow. So the jealous eagle pulled out a feather out of his wing and said, here, use this. The arrow was shot but didn't quite reach the bird. He's flying too high, so the first eagle pulled out another feather and said, try again. Another feather, try again. He kept using these feathers on the end of his arrow. Try again. Pretty soon, the jealous, envious eagle stood there without any feathers. The archer took advantage of the situation, turned around and killed the helpless bird. You see, that's the insanity of envy. Those that fly higher should inspire us, not intimidate us. Number four, envy interrupts God's protective covenant. The people in the camp, Psalm 105, 16, were jealous of Moses and envious of Aaron, the Lord's holy priest. So Korah, Dathan, Abira. Who do you think you are, Moses? Aren't we all God's people? God can speak to us just as well as he speaks to you. We're all equal. It's true. They were all equal as people, but God had put Moses in authority. They started putting Moses down, envying his position. The earth opened up and swallowed them and their families and all their possessions, and then the earth closed up. And God settled that matter. You see, God's protective covenant when envy steps in, God steps out. When envy steps in, God's protective covenant is interrupted. When Achan envied the thing that was forbidden and took it into his tent, God's protective covenant was canceled over Achan's life. And Achan was burned to death with his family and all his possessions because of the dagger of envy. He ended up losing everything. He's not the only person that steals God's gold and silver. 
Number five, envy disables our spiritual growth. 1 Peter 2, 1 to 3. So clean house, make a clean sweep of malice and pretense, envy and hurtful talk. You've, t- you've had a taste of God, now like infants at the breast, drink deep of God's pure kindness. Then you'll grow up mature and whole in God. And Jesus, in Mark 7, said it's what comes out from the inside that defiles you. For from within, out of a man's heart, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these vile things, he called them vile things, come from within. They are what defile you or sabotage you. And the implication is that if we don't rid ourselves of malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, etc., that will not grow in our salvation. That is, that will not grow spiritually. And number six, envy that is not dealt with and forgiven can keep a person from God's kingdom. Galatians 5, 19 to 21, when you follow the desire of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, Outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. And notice, envy is tucked right into the list with sexual immorality and wild parties. In Romans 1, 28-32 put it this way, since they didn't bother to acknowledge God, God quit bothering them and let them run loose. Do you see what this is saying? When, when God is dealing with us about something and we don't bother to acknowledge God, God will quit bothering us and let us run loose. If we say, well, you know, pastor's teaching us about these self-sabotage daggers, you know, that just, that, that, he, he just doesn't know what he's talking about. If God is dealing with you, you better let him deal with you. It says, and so God just let them run loose. He God says, okay, I'm not going to talk to you about it anymore. You you don't want to. You don't want to hear me. Uh, Okay, I'm not going to. You don't want to bother with me. I'm not going to bother with you. And and then all hell broke loose. Rampant evil, grabbing and grasping, vicious backbiting. They made life hell on earth with their what? Envy, wanton killing, bickering, cheating. Look at them, mean spirited, venomous, fork tongued, God bashers. Bullies, swaggers, unsufferable windbags. They keep inventing new ways of wrecking lives. They ditch their parents when they get in the way. Now listen to what God's Word calls them. Stupid, slimy, cruel, cold-blooded. And it's not as if they don't know better. They know perfectly well they're spitting in God's face and they don't care. Worse, they hand out prizes to those who do the worst things best. This is the list of those who have no part in God's kingdom. And envy is listed. It says in Acts 13, 45, when the Jews saw the crowds filled with envy and jealousy, they contradicted what was said by Paul and talked abusively, reveling and slandering him. Remember, when you begin to make your mark, somebody always comes with an eraser. Now, you're saying, I really want to avoid the self-sabotage dagger of envy. How many are saying that? You're saying that? Okay. Here's what we do. Number one, when you see something someone else has that you would like, the first thing you have to do is you've got to do something spiritual. You've got to realize that envy is a tool of the devil. Envy causes all kinds. It causes people to lie about people so they can get some gain from those people. Uh, it, it causes you to make things up. To uh, all, all kinds of things envy causes is say, You know, I like what you got, I want it, but I love God more. Get away from me, Satan, in Jesus' name. You see, it starts with the Spirit. When we find ourselves envying and somebody has something, whether it's possession or position, that we would like, we can say, yeah, they've got what I would like, but I love God a whole lot more. Therefore, Satan, get behind me. I am not going to sabotage my life. That's number one. Number two is be outrageously generous. Be outrageously generous. I don't know if any of you caught Ken Copeland's program this morning. 
and, and I come in early, do my praying and final little coloring my notes and all that, and I keep the TV on. And so while I'm shaving and, you know, fixing my hair and dialing up, uh, I have Ken Copeland on in the background. And there was a testimony of a guy on there that was $100,000 plus in debt, him and his wife, and they struggled with this debt. They just couldn't seem to, they were giving to God, they loved God, they were giving, they were seemed to be generous people. They were tithing, you know, so easy a caveman can do it, you know. And they were doing all the things, but they just couldn't seem to dig out of this debt. And they finally made it a point to go to a Ken Copeland Believer's Voice of Victory campaign. They were in line waiting, and they met a street preacher, and the street preacher said, yeah, I'm, I've been getting out of debt. You know, God's been getting my finances together, and he said, I've just got this much debt left in my life. Now, the guy didn't the guy with $100,000 plus debt didn't say anything, but he could have said, that's all the debt you got. I wish I had your debt. You know, he could have envied that guy's debt because that guy's debt was, didn't say what it was. I'm guessing maybe $15,000. They're sitting in the service, and he, he looks up three rows ahead of him and sees that street preacher that's only got like $15,000 to go till he's totally debt-free. And God spoke to the man that was $100,000 in debt and said, I want you to pay off his debt. He wrote out a check because the, the street preacher had told him what the debt was. He, he didn't tell him. They were just talking. He didn't tell him as a hint or anything. And after the service, he, and he told his wife, he said, God told me to do that. And his wife, she said, how are we going to pay for our hotel room? <laughs> He said, I don't know, God's going to have to take care of that because this is what he told me to do. And he wrote out the check. You know, that, that check would have put a chunk in their own debt, and he paid off the debt. He said, here, I want you to pay off that debt. Now you're debt free. In six months, this couple that was over $100,000 in debt, in six months, they got a surprise inheritance not only got them completely out of debt, they were able to tithe on it, give on it, and open an account with the, what they call their blessing account so they can bless others. God, in, in six months, God brought them out. Generosity. You see, we think generosity is when we give God 10% of, of our income. Generosity, you see, if I could get this through, it's never about money, it's about obedience. And generosity, when, we, when we're generous with waitresses, when we're outrageously generous, you say, well, 20% tip, give her 25. Give her 30%. If, I, if my meal's only $7, I'll give them $3. Just make it an even 10. You know, why? Because I know who I represent. And not only that, I want generosity not to just be a one-time thing. I want it to be a way of life with me. You know what it does? It keeps me from envying. And then number three, rejoice when others are blessed. When others are blessed, rejoice with them. Smile, send a card, make a call. You want, I want to tell you something. This staff of ministers we have here at Mount Hope are the finest group of men that I have ever seen assembled anywhere in the United States of America or the world. You know, I said... You know, as Harry often says, success without a successor is failure. And I, I've known for, for a long time, you know, that there's going to be one day that I'm going to have to be overseer of all these 41 churches and help them out, and I'm going to need to turn the church over to somebody. And I asked my whole staff, I, and I knew in my heart that probably Kevin Barry, you know, he's the youngest, he's sharp, he's intelligent, he has my heart, has my vision, and he wants me to stay here even if, I, even if I'm not the pastor, he wants me to stay here. Now that was really important to me. And, and, <laughs> and, and I had him, and I go to my whole staff, I go to my whole pastoral staff, and I say, who do you guys think would be the best for my successor? And you know what? There was not one bit of jostling for power not one of them said, well, I think it should be me. Well, it should be me. I've been here the longest. And uh, John, John Eliff said, don't look at me. <laughs> and every one of them, after prayer, they said, Pastor Dave, Kevin Barry. Every one of them. There's not one bit of jealousy, not one bit of envy. They say, we just want God's will. 
And Kevin is not clawing to be pastor. He wishes I would stay here for 20 more years. You know, it, it, it wouldn't bother him at all. But they knew that he should be the executive minister over the other pastors and begin to phase in more and more so I can... We've got 41 Mount Hope churches now, you know. And I, they always want me to come, and I could be a big help if I could go to them once in a while, but I can't if you're going to make me be here every week, you know. <laughs> so, so, what was number three? Rejoice when somebody else is blessed. Send them a card. Uh, if somebody gets a promotion, send them, hey, I heard you got promoted. Uh, God bless you. You're looking for a promotion. You didn't get it. They did. Hey, send them a card anyway. Tell them how proud you are. Number uh, D is make sure Jesus is Lord of your life because only when Jesus is Lord of our life is the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And the love of God, the agape love of God, is not envious, boastful, or proud, and love never fails. And so make sure Jesus is Lord of your life. Be willing to turn from your sin and be willing to make Jesus Lord of your life because he died on the cross, rose from the dead. He's God's only plan to get us into heaven. And number five is walk in the Spirit daily because in Galatians 5.22, we read Galatians 5.19 to 21, told all those nasty things, but it says, if you walk in the Spirit, you'll not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, goodness, gentleness, etc. All the opposite things of these daggers. And finally, number seven, is become shamelessly thankful. You know, people that are thankful for what they have instead of envying somebody else for what they have set themselves up for more. The Lord is my strength and shield. I trust Him with all my heart. He helps me, and my heart is filled with joy. I burst out in songs of thanksgiving. And one more scripture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go in his courts with praise. You know, you can't even get into God's courtyard without going through the gateway of thanksgiving. And you get through the courts with praise. You can't get to the holy place or the holy of holies without first coming through the gate. And it says, enter his gates with what? Thanksgiving is the key to get in the gates to the one that has all the storehouses with everything you could ever imagine, dream, or think and is able to give you the power to get everything you imagine, dream, or think. But these self-sabotage daggers keep us from God's very best. Probably one of the most tragic events that turned out to be a great victory was when the leaders envied and were jealous of Jesus, and so they executed him on a cross. It's pretty sad when religious leaders envy one another and do things to hurt one another. They couldn't duplicate his miracles. They couldn't come up to his leadership or authority. They couldn't gather the crowds Jesus gathered, and so... It'd be better to execute him, get him out of here. But the third day, he said, I'm back. And he raised up a team of millions all over this globe. And in these final moments, God is raising up emerging leaders that say, I'm not going to give in to any dagger, even the slightest little tip in my heart. I'm going to serve God. I'm going all the way with Jesus. I'm going to be content in the calling God has given me, and I'm not going to try to create something I'm not, be something I'm not, or go after something I, I shouldn't have. And I'm going to rejoice in other people's blessings. We hope you enjoyed this message. For more information about Dr. Dave Williams or to access the latest resources, please visit www.davewilliams.com. And now, for the entire Dave Williams ministry team, may God bless you richly. This is the earth shaking.